Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kate Farrell, and I'm so happy to be here at the Strand. Uh, the Strand holds a very special place in my heart because when I was 18 years old and a bit of a lost soul, I was going to NYU, but I didn't know what I was doing there. And I ended up dropping out and trying to get a job. And no one would hire me. I remember after many rejections going um, for an interview at this really crappy little place, um, like on Nassau Street down in the financial district. And it was like a gross store and they sold edible underwear and stuff like that. <laughs> and I thought, um, well, this place will totally hire me. I will be great at selling this crap. Um, but they, they did not. And, uh, and then I came to the Strand and they asked me to take a test to see if I knew anything about books. And I, I guess I did okay because they gave me a job. Um, so I love the Strand and I'm extra proud to be here in my favorite store uh, tonight with three of the amazing contributors to this really cool book that we made, a period 12 voices tell the bloody truth about, uh, <laughs> It's about a subject that we are all really eager to just talk and talk and talk about, and we hope you all are too. Um, so I want to introduce these brilliant women sitting next to me. Um, Ashley Reese, starting from over there, um, <laughs> is a staff writer at Jezebel, who has also contributed to Teen Vogue, Rookie, ID, Girl, Vulture, Golly Magazine, and The Gloss. She's in the early stages of writing a book about her days as a 20-something-year-old virgin living in NYC. Catch her starting fights with random people on Twitter at Offbeat Orbit. Um, in the middle is Dr. Elizabeth Yuko. Um, she is a bioethicist and writer specializing in sexual and reproductive health and the intersection of ethics and pop culture. She's an adjunct professor of ethics at Fordham University has written for publications including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, Rolling Stone, Pacific Standard, Ms. Magazine, and Playboy, and has given a TEDx talk on the Golden Girls and bioethics, which I know you all want to hear about how those intersect. Um, Jennifer Weiss-Wolf, right next to me, is a writer and advocate for equitable menstrual policy in America. In addition to being a contributor to our book, she's the author of Periods Gone Public, Taking a Stand for Menstrual Equity. Newsweek called her the architect of the US policy campaign to squash the tampon tax. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Bustle named her one of the nation's badass menstrual activists. <laughs> Jen's writing and work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Time, Newsweek, Cosmopolitan, Glamour, The Nation, Bloomberg, and Ms. Magazine, among others. And by day, she serves as a vice president of the Brennan Center for Justice at the NYU School of Law. We should get some stuff done. Um, I'd like to begin by saying that all of us who are able to be here tonight for this panel are cisgender women without physical disabilities, and consequently, our discussion may lean toward areas that fall within areas of our lived experience. Um, but some of the most important things that I learned while working on this book um, are that periods affect different kinds of bodies in different ways. Not all people with periods are women, and not all women have periods. We welcome all points of view to this discussion, and we hope to be as inclusive as we can except for sexists and bigots. <laughs> I doubt that you're here, but if you are, we're not including you. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to start off with a, a question um, for everybody, whoever wants to jump in. So um, the news is pretty overwhelming these days. And every day, it seems like even worse things are happening than we could have imagined the day before. In the face of this, maybe it seems like the shame, stigma, and inequities associated with our periods are not that big of a deal. Um, can you guys help us understand why it's still important to fight for change in this arena? And how, how do periods affect how the people who have them are able to participate in society and why that matters? Should we go in order or do we want to go here first? Okay. 
Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Um, first of all, I'm so excited to be at the Strand too. This is so exciting. And I think we're all so excited about this, this book. It is just such an incredible collection um, of perspectives and stories and voices. So um, anyway, thank you all for being here. And on this question, I'm actually gonna take, I wanna dial it back a little bit, about a year and a half, because while I was writing the other book and was doing actually the two of these in tandem because this chapter is, is sort of a shorter representation of the, of the fuller book periods gone public, I had started writing it in the fall of 2016 when the future of America and the world still seemed pretty bright. And then November 8th happened and I thought to myself, how the hell am I gonna keep writing this book? How does any of this still matter? Why is anyone gonna care about the eight cents on the dollar tampon tax in light of the utter degradation of democracy that lies ahead of us? And that was where my head was at and I just kept writing because I had contract, I had no choice but to keep writing. Um, but, but then it all started to become a little more clear to me, particularly at the Women's March after Inauguration Day, which is just known as the Women's March. Inauguration Day is the day before the Women's March um, in 2017. And I saw so many signs that were, and, and chants and, and proud declarations that were linking Trump's own derogatory remarks about menstruation while on the campaign trail, Megyn Kelly, blood coming out of her wherever, to the entire fight that was at hand. And it really dawned on me that actually periods are the heart of all of this. And, and it's come across even more, I think, over the past year. When, when Periods Gone Public came out, in fact, was right when the first Harvey Weinstein allegations emerged and, and the Me Too hashtag started trending. And I realized, again, this is all the same. This is what dystopia looks like when our stories and our experiences and our bodies and our lives are not forget elevated, even acknowledged. This idea of disconnect, oh, I didn't know that was happening. It, it, it's, it's truly the ultimate dystopia that our reality is not part of the narrative and not part of the dialogue. And the way I've chosen to focus on periods and think about them has been through the lens of policy. Um, asking why it is our laws don't acknowledge this, this, this normal and regular aspect of the lives of half the population and what they would look like and what our culture and society might look like if our laws did in fact acknowledge it. And, and, that's, and that's the work I've done and that's the story I've told both in this chapter and in the book, in, in, the, in the Fuller book, um, which goes back to your question, it is all interconnected. There's not one and the other. There's not a worse problem and a bigger problem and, and the worst problem. These, these are all one and the same. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll take us back to just today, as I said, we were talking in the room behind us um, back there, that there's actually a feature story in the New York Times today, um, ev even as we're grappling with one of what seems like the most horrific human rights abuses in front of us right now as we see what's happening at the border and in Texas, um, that there's a, story, a feature in the New York Times today about conditions for um, young girls living in Nepal who are, who are banished from their homes during their periods and that it is actually a life and death situation for them. There's a story in the nation today about the politics of periods and why this policy agenda continues to matter. Um, and I, as I mentioned, I'm speaking to a reporter about really highlighting the problem for people who are being detained in camps and cages and whatever the administration argues about calling them. Um, and again, how menstruation and their bodies are also part of that story. So. I don't think it's different. I don't think there's an either or. It's, it's clearly a both and, and it's clearly all the same story is, is my response to the, that. Thank you. Um, I think like, just to add on that, um, a lot of this has to do with access. Um, and I think that a lot of the kind of rec <coughs> like reclaiming menstruation kind of stuff has been really fun and cute. I mean, I'm wearing like a shirt that like has tampon illustrations over it, so like I'm complicit in that. But I think that um, it's easy to kind of see it as a little bit frivolous. But when you think, when you kind of look at it as like a human rights issue, it's not. I mean, when you think about, if we're gonna think about like human rights abuses and the conditions of marginalized people, think about people who have periods in jail and whether or not they have access to a tampon or a pad or whatever as easily as we do. Um, they can't just go to CVS and get one. There's actually stories of people in jail being humiliated because they have to bleed all over themselves. 
um, just the, it's about the way we treat each other. People who receive dignity and who are worth dignity, who aren't. Kind of going back to the border, think, like, think about people in these camps, these detention centers, whatever you want to call them, who are on their period right now. I mean, like, can you, I mean, I think that when we kind of step back and look at it as just kind of like thinking about who deserves dignity, who deserves like this basic like sanitation, um, who has access to that, who is seen as dirty if they, you know, because of it. I think that it's easy to see how like this is beyond just like, like power the period, like, or like, oh, well, you know, stuff like that. I think it's really important. Totally agree with what my uh, co-panelists have said. Two quick additions. One, when you said that you weren't sure how you're going to continue to write your book after the election, um, the day of the election, or the day after the election, actually, was the day I gave my TED Talk on the Golden Girls and bioethics. I had been up the entire night uh, weeping in my bed um, the night before and showed up bleary-eyed, just just not in a good in a good frame of mind and thinking how am i going to talk about a sitcom when the world is doomed and but really it's it's kind of something similar is okay it's it's kind of an extreme example but we're talking about women's health and uh people with uteruses and vaginas health and that's not frivolous and that's not something that we should ignore uh even you know in the wake of of something uh as tragic as that election um but and kind of going off what ashley was saying when I have my period and I'm curled up on my couch with a heating pad and chocolate and Netflix, I'm, you know, not comfortable, but I'm, you know, I'm <laughs> still, still not enjoying my time, let's say. Um, but yeah, when you're thinking about people who are at the border right now or who are being uh, detained anywhere or who have been affected by all the natural disasters in the past year who don't have access to these products, they're going through all of the terrible things while bleeding, and in some cases free bleeding, or using rolled up socks or toilet paper or whatever they can get their hands on. So um, yeah, it definitely still matters, and everything you've described happens with someone bleeding, so. Yeah, thank you, Guy. Um, can I jump in with one of more, course. more comment on that? Because I think as, so, so this pol I, I speak sort of broadly about this idea of a policy agenda, but what the policy agenda is is actually addressing these very questions, starting with the question of affordability and access. And in this incredibly toxic, polarized environment, folks should know that this, this particular agenda has taken off like wildfire. The Governor, Governor Northam of Virginia just signed the bill yesterday that makes menstrual products fully, freely accessible to incarcerated women in the, all the state prisons. It's not just that Governor Northam did it. They're the sixth state to do it this year. Um, this is part of federal legislation that just passed in the House um, it focused on the experience of incarcerated people. Uh, the states of Illinois and California have passed laws that are in effect right now, making menstrual products freely available in public schools. New York City was the place that pioneered this legislation that passed in 2016 to make th these products fully available in all the schools, shelters, and correction facilities that all of this legislation that's advancing now um, is built on. So the idea of telling this story about access and affordability and dignity uh, through, through a lens of, I put it in an equity lens, I have thought that was the most potent policy argument that our legislators might not be moved by dignity or health or even rights, but <laughs> equity I thought might be the, the catch and it's turned out to be. Um, but in this especially challenging political time that this legislation is passing, that it's affirmative, that it's not, we're not just able to say we've kept the worst stuff from happening, but that we are making an affirmative good, that we are forging a positive proactive agenda that has bizarrely bipartisan support. There are as many Republicans who are behind this legislation as Democrats. For some reasons that make sense to me and some that are beyond my imagination why. Um, but that, that in and of itself has to also be a sign of hope and good news in this time yeah. too. And there's so little good news Absolutely. that take let's take what we, we can, can get it. too. Yeah. So that kind of brings it full yeah. circle to why it matters today too. It's yeah. something we can actually win, at least in the policy and political arena.
which is great. So, to f like, a quick follow-up on that. Like, what are ways that we can keep fighting and winning? Um, you know, are there, like, concrete actions that you would recommend that people in this room can take, like, to continue pushing that agenda and to help support it? Well, I'll answer on the I'll answer on the policy front. I think each of us can speak a little differently in the you know in the communities that we that we deal with. These are my pop culture mavens <laughs> next to me, and I wish I was a pop culture maven, but I'm far from it. <laughs> um, but on the policy agenda, in any event, um, letting your legislators know that you are paying attention to this and that you care. Um, is, is incredibly important. These campaigns, in particularly in the state of Arizona, in the state of Kentucky, in the state of Virginia, that have been successful in making sure that menstrual products are available to those who need them, haven't happened in the dark and haven't happened without a lot of social media activism, without a lot of organizing. The folks in Virginia were particularly effective at making sure this didn't get swept under the rug, that the proper language and framing and, and discussion points were raised. So this is everyday citizen activism. This isn't, you know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. This isn't right. special you know, special credentials. This is this is what everybody can do with your phone, with your social media accounts. Um, call your legislators. You read it every single day now. Certainly call yeah. them about what's happening at the border, but call them about this too. They they actually like this because again, this has bipartisan support. It's got it's got talking points that they can live with. It it creates what I love about this particular agenda as well is that it's not just that it creates a good in and of itself, that menstrual access is something that we need, but it paves the way for talking about more complicated issues too. We call, I always joke that it's the gateway drug, um, but it paves the way for talking about issues that relate to our bodies and our dignity and our lives and our health um, and, our, and, our, and our engagement and our role as citizens. Um, so that, that's at least my advice here to a room full of, of interested, active people, is make this one of your, your talking points, make this one of your agenda items that you're willing to call your legislators to task on, every, from everywhere, from your town council, to your state representatives, to your members of Congress. I, I, think, that. I think that another, um, just like small action that you can do, um, I guess this would benefit like teenagers the most, or young people who are, at school and I mean if it's anything like my high school which I don't think high schools really change a lot they're kind of like the same like the like my high school bathroom was, this did not change since like the 80s so a lot of high schools probably still have the like put the quarter in like turn that like weird knob and get like a cardboard tampon out I think that you know as much as we're like oh like death but like there's people who need those in a lot of situations and I think that the fact that you still have to pay for those is yeah. absurd um, and I think that even if like teenagers got together at their and like kind of petitioned either their principal or like um, someone higher up on their school board to have a way to make those products more accessible would be great. Um, I mean, even if you yourself can like afford that or you can like, you know, talk to a friend who can like hook you up, like there's lots of people who don't have that or maybe are too shy or just literally can't, can't afford it and don't have a quarter on them. Um, so I think that those are little steps you can do to make people at your school um, maybe feel a little bit more loved <laughs> in the yeah, bathroom. Yeah, absolutely. Those, like, we, did, we, we, uh, we did that at McMillan in the Flatiron Building. We were super excited one day when the free tampons and the pads showed up outside of the machine in these little plastic boxes. It was really awesome, and it lasted like, what would you guys say? <laughs> like, McMillan ladies who are here, like, maybe two months? And then I guess the demand outstripped the supply. The boxes are empty. Um, yeah, we have to do some agitating again, but like. It does keep happening. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Recurring phenomenon. Um, uh, do you want to weigh in on this again? Sure, too? just with a very quick, uh, just talking about periods helps to normalize the conversation. And I'm not saying go to your friends and say, hey, I'm a period right now. You can if you want, you absolutely can. But a good friend of mine, uh, who's not here tonight, but she, uh, she talks about her period a lot, and her guy friends have actually commented, you know what, since you've talked about needing a tampon, or you know what, you're gonna skip this activity because you have uh, cramps, it's made them more aware of it. So it's not giant change, but it's just helping to normalize this as a normal biological function. Yeah, absolutely. I see that. I see that with, you know, younger people now. And also, I think just even like in my experience, working on this book has made me more open to like being 
like just talking about it at work and you know stuff like that where I might not have before um, and it does I think make a difference you know just to like it's just to be matter of fact it's just part of life I have to say, you know, I, I, I've only been involved in this work for a couple of years. It's been about three and a half years, and, and I kind of stumbled into it. So it, it, it was New Year's Day 2015, so it's a very clear marker to me, too. So life before, you know, as of New Year's Eve 2014 versus life of New Year's Day 2015 and on, I've said the word period tampon menstruation like exponentially more times in those three years than, you know, the 47 or so that led up mm -hmm. to it. And those have been the best three years, of, <laughs> the best three years. Well worth the, the yeah. transformation. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, I'm going to pivot to uh, some pop culture. Um, so Elizabeth and Ashley, as we mentioned, you guys are the pop culture mavens. And Jen, I know nothing period related ever slips past you. Um, so I'd love to hear what you all think about this if you want to weigh in. Um, has the portrayal of periods in pop culture evolved, do you think? Are there more periods being referenced? And are the scenarios different in tone than they once were? Here's my take. Um, and I know I don't watch, a, like, I'm not watching a lot of Disney Channel anymore. <laughs> Um, not to knock anyone who's 27 and still does, but I, my impression from like, you know, the different teen TV shows that I know are out there is that I think that they're way more progressive in a lot of ways, but weirdly enough, I don't think they're very, they're not much more progressive in terms of how they portray periods or if they do it at all. Um, I remember very distinctly seeing, okay, there's two different TV shows that had periods on TV when I was growing up, and I was like, whoa. Um, one, which I think a lot of you might know about, is an episode of Degrassi, in which Emma came to school feeling like, like the hottest thing ever, had a white skirt on, and then, like, of course, any time a character wears white, <laughs> it's like, you know, um, then she's like, oh, my period. Um, yeah, yeah, and um, there's also a show called, I don't remember a show called Braceface, way back, yeah. There was an iconic episode of Braceface where like, sh I think her name's Shannon or something, she's like on this date with her, like her crush, it's going so well, but oh, her stomach hurts. And I think she thinks she's having appendicitis and then he takes her to the hospital and all she she just had like she just started her, her first period, period? <laughs> yeah <laughs> and there was this moment where like the nurse like came out with like a bag of like you know like the like the like the um very medical pads and uh -huh. like it flew across the room and like the guy she had a crush on saw it and he's like oh i have sisters it's okay and she's like no i can't see you anymore so it was like <laughs> um I, I those things really stuck out to me because um it was I mean, it was the early 2000s, and those were the only really, like, mm -hmm. clear reference. And, like, and not even, like, in a, it wasn't couched in a, like, I don't know, like a, like a seventh heaven type way of, like, oh, we need to have a really special conversation <laughs> about, like, or, like, or, like, uh -huh. like, little Marnie started her first period. It wasn't like that. It was, like, this was, this isn't a family show. This was four teenagers or four preteens, and that felt really special. Um, I think that I can only name a couple examples of newer TV shows that have, like, really explicitly had, um, like, pretty, in, like, vivid period things. There's a, there's a British show called My Mad Fat Diary in which... Um, the main character stopped her period for a while because of different like different things she was going through. Then it started again, and she was like, ah. And then um, the only other example I can think of at the top of my head was this Netflix show called Big Mouth, which had a oh, really really show. funny period episode in my I'll opinion. Watch that if you have it. It's I mean the show was ridiculous, but that episode was really really good. Um, but for the most part, I don't know. Maybe someone can tell me if like Disney Channel is ha has TV shows that like has like you know a character getting their first period and it like you know not being couched in some like yeah i think maybe it'll depend on whether uh, it's mostly men still writing them yeah that too i mean it's just it's just fascinating because i think that like a lot of shows are kind of starting to like catch up with the fact that their audiences are like more woke now like i mean like props to like tumblr and stuff for that but like for the most part though i don't really i don't think much has changed that's my take 
I have thoughts as well. Um, I so, know you do. Uh, that was what my chapter in the book was about. So for a lot of us, um, I'm, I was unfortunately too old for Degrassi and Brace Face when that happened. Okay. So my, <laughs> my first exposure, and I'm sure a lot of yours as well, was Judy Bloom's Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret. And the fact that so many years later, that's still such an iconic period yeah. moment in pop culture. Well, it stands to the fact that she's, she's an amazing writer. She's Judy freaking Bloom, so there's that. But also, there hasn't been a lot that has yeah, followed it. So that's part of the reason I'm super excited to be part of this. But yeah, there just wasn't. And I was so hungry for examples, either in books or on TV, where I could see something where it wasn't, you know, I read it and read it, that part of Margaret, and was so worried about belts and clips. Um, uh, but luckily, when I got my period, those weren't existing anymore. And she, Julie, Judy Bloom has said in interviews that actually they... Uh, they changed yeah, they the book. Yeah, yeah, they updated the book. And also, uh, shortly after the book was published, adhesive pads came on the market. So mm. it became outdated very quickly. But because that was so such a jarring moment for a lot of readers, that really stuck with people. So that was, that was a big one. Then kind of skipping forward a little bit, uh, you had usually two categories of when periods appear in pop culture. One, the first period. So very traumatic. Girl, you're a woman now. Or, you know, some sort of tender moment like you were talking mm. about. Or it's the total opposite. It's the start of menopause. So you're all dried up. Your period's not coming. Uh, there's an episode of The Golden Girls know, where Blanche doesn't. That's not doesn't. how it goes down, by right. the way. <laughs> exactly. One day she's like, I'm pregnant. No, I've got my period. No more period. And then she ends up um, starting menopause. Uh, Archie Bunker's wife, um, Edith, started uh, menopause and all in the family. There was an episode of Sex in the City, which weirdly did not address periods, except for in very tangential ways. Uh, when Samantha th doesn't get her period, and so she thinks she's starting to get all dried up, but ends up getting it mid... Um, sex situation with this gross man with a rat tail. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so it's usually beginning or end. So what I think is really interesting is the middle parts, where you just have a regular woman in her late teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, just getting her period. And um, so I think a good recent example of this was Broad City. Uh, they had an episode um, where, yes, where they're on the plane, one of the characters needs a tampon, she can't find it. Then another kind of subplot of that, is, or detail, is Alana is trying to smuggle weed through the airport, so she wears jeans stained with her period blood, so they don't check her. And <laughs> I've actually been using a version of that myself for years. Um, when I have to go through metal detectors, and, you know, I have stuff in my bag. Okay, I, this... I, I don't space. smuggle things anymore, but um, <laughs> if I had to in the past, I would cover it with pads and tampons. The, the guy, usually, uh, never believe yeah. a guy, would look at me like, oh, do whatever you want, yeah. take anything. <laughs> and then now, this is a good tip for everybody, um, if I'm in like a Starbucks or a coffee shop and I want a table and um, there's only a few, I will take the biggest, bulkiest menstrual product I have in my bag and put it on the table to claim it and no one goes <laughs> near it. So that's... Broad City kind of picked up on that. Um, the episode of Big Mouth Ashley was talking about was great. It features a uh, music video of Michael Stipe as a tampon <laughs> singing. And uh, everybody bleeds, yes. <laughs> so that's great. Uh -huh. um, and one that I wrote about in the book that kind of was more controversial than I thought it was going to be was uh, the episode of the recent Netflix uh, Anne of Green Gables reboot, Anne with an E. Uh, the first season, one episode shows Anne Shirley getting her first period. And I was speaking at a conference in Halifax, Nova Scotia last spring, actually on periods in pop culture, um, and because Canada does, does everything ahead of us, like elect good people and <laughs> handsome ones also. Um, and uh, so they, I got all these questions about Anne getting her period and that hadn't started on our Netflix yet. So I didn't know what it was and um, people were up in arms about it. They kept saying, my childhood was ruined. How could you take this beloved character, Anne Shirley, the beloved orphan from Anne of Green Gables and make her get her period? What? I'm sorry. Part of what I loved about Anne was how much of myself I saw in her, mm -hmm. and that only made me see myself in her more. And if that would have been around when I was 13, 
that would have been worn out in my VCR or my videotape. I would have rewound that so many times. And they don't just talk about it. They show her getting startled, sitting up in bed, running downstairs, putting the kettle on. They show bloody sheets. They have her uh, kind of foster mother, Marilla, there saying, okay, how are you going to wash this? First you wash it in cold to get the blood out. Then you wash it in hot. And that's exactly how my mother taught me to wash my period stained underwear. So... Um, but yeah, kind of the, the reaction to this of ruining childhoods, I thought was so indicative of how stigmatized periods still are. And um, but anyway, could go on a lot, but I'm going to stop here. Uh-huh. I mean, ruining child, my childhood would have been way better if there yes. was a period episode of Lizzie McGuire. I mean, they had the bra episode. I thought like, okay, this is getting like spicy, Disney Channel. I see you. And then nothing. Yeah. Nothing beyond that. A little generation gap here because my childhood was Carrie, for God's oh, sake. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, really bad. Right? Like yeah. the, the ultimate period oh. male fear everything. Um, but, you know, it's funny because I, I have, I have Less, no current pop culture reference. There's not a single show you named that I'd heard of. Yipes. But um, the, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. More yeah. my comfort zone. One of the really interesting things I learned in doing research was, so if, if you open the front of Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, you'll see that she dedicates, the Judy Bloom dedicates the book to her mother for introducing her to her two favorite um, young girl protagonists, uh, The Diary of Anne Frank and Scout Finch, To Kill a Mockingbird. And what's really fascinating, and, and Judy Bloom couldn't have really known this at the time when this book was published, is all three of those protagonists actually have periods in common and, and have been banned from libraries for almost you know intersecting reasons. And Frank, because of her, her frank references to sexuality and menstruation in, in, in all the other things going on around her, that's the bannable offense of the Diary of Anne Frank. Mm -hmm. And in To Kill a Mockingbird, we had to wait a long time to see this, and I I don't know if everybody else dived into Ghost at a Watchman or or feared, you know, the devolution of Atticus Finch, but I didn't because Scout has been my heroine my entire life. And in Ghost at a Watchman, which which is the prequel written before To Kill a Mockingbird about Scout as an adult looking back at her childhood, there's an entire chapter about Scout's first period. And it's like almost like a fantasy that you got to know Scout not just as a five-year-old or a six-year-old, but as a 12-year-old. Oh, yeah. And her experience, if you haven't read it, read it. Like her experience is so brilliantly Scout that it's, it's, you know, it's just kind of worth everything. But I'll share that in, in the, the release of, of Periods Gone Public, I, I was doing a lot of pop culture media, you know, pop culture or pop news sources for the release. And I will share with you that Good Morning America told me point blank they won't cover menstruation or postpartum depression on the show and they wouldn't what? cover the book. What? And I did a full hour show on NPR with the release of the book, which was wonderful. The first time they'd ever done a full hour just on this particular topic. And I was with uh, Senator Cory Booker came on. He would not say the words tampon. Um, he just Uh-oh. kept saying essential hygiene items. And um, <laughs> The host of the show, who was wonderful, and it was a really, really terrific episode, every time there was a a break, you know, a PSA break that NPR does, he would come back by warning the audience to, if they had young children in the room, that this was very difficult, sensitive material, and they might want to wait till another time that was more appropriate to listen as a family. And I was floored because it was such a great conversation, and it was, the host was wonderful, and it was really quite gratifying to do this whole hour, but each time he would do that, I would want to like slam the microphone down and walk out or just say, why the hell are you doing that? But I couldn't. Um, so anyway, there's a few little, wow. He's one of the good ones. And that was just, you know, that was, that was in October. Wow. Really quickly, yeah. really quickly. I'm sorry, you mentioned um, Anne Frank and how there was a, I just have a, I, you know when like a memory just comes surging back. Um, I remember like around the time when I got my very first period, there was a multi-part thing on TV, like a dramatization of like um, the Diary of Anne Frank. And I never read the book, but I watched some of it. And there was a moment where she got her period and I was watching it with my dad and I ran out of the room for whatever, I ran out of the room because I was just like, oh my God, my dad saw like menstrual blood. Like how, like as if he'd never known what a period was. He had like, he was one of 15, he had a lot of sisters. I think he knew what a period was. But like, it's, it's wild how like, how afraid we are of like other people knowing about it at that age right yeah actually that was i mean i think we're gonna 
wrap it up in a, in, a, in a couple minutes so that we can give people a chance to ask questions if they want to, but I have so many questions. We could keep on talking about it for a long time. It was one of the things that um, I had hoped to talk about was that, was that I have an 11-year-old son, and so he's just right at that age where the girls are starting to get like sort of separated and talk to about periods, and, and I've been really conscious of trying to, I mean, I've tried to be open about it his whole life, but of, of also like, of you know, paying attention to how they do that and how that could really be like the start of kind of, 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 of certainly of boys and men feeling alienated from it because, I mean, obviously you have to give girls this like safe space where they feel that they can talk about this when they're at the stage of life where they would really rather not do that at all. Um, but, but it, creates that aura of like, oh, this is secret female business that is like embarrassing or weird and boys can't hear about it. Like, I wonder if there's a better way to do that, that kind of to, from the beginning to like make boys and men just more included and have it just be like, this is totally normal, not embarrassing or weird. I have one thing that I'll jump in with. So in, in um, the larger policy book, it puts forth um, many, um, I, I take nine areas of public policy and public life and examine them through this lens of, of, of why don't we include menstruation. And so in the education lens, it's not just about educating people about their bodies and, and, and taking care of a bodily function, but it's act, the proposal that I make is that we actually integrate menstruation to all of our curricula. There's no reason in the literature that we've been talking about and the film that, this, that, that periods shouldn't be part of what we discuss in English class, in, in social studies, certainly in math and science. I mean, it, it intersects all of these things and actually creates really, really um, usable, manageable lessons in which you're just, you're just normalizing it as mm -hmm. part of the entire human condition, not as a segregated, just how you take care of your body, what you need to know about, you yeah. know, what, now yeah. that you're turning 11. Right. Um, and, and it's, when you think about school especially, um, and school children, school, school is the first, is the very first sort of public society, microcosm of full society that kids learn to engage in. And if we're able to get it right for them in school, we're creating an entire generation that will have a better handle on how to get it right in their lives more fully. So that, that's one idea that, that exists in this, this policy menu that, that speaks to that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that sounds like a very positive move. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to advocate for that in, in my son's school. Um, so I think we do still have time for, for questions, if people would like to. Uh, yes. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh she's coming. <laughs> Hi. Thanks, ladies. Um, a couple things. The pop culture in terms of television, this last season on Blackish, which airs primetime ABC, they did a really... I think that they do a really great job addressing most social and familial issues, but particularly with their young female character who plays Diane, who's like always very gruff and aggressive. They find out that she's starting her period and there's sort of this horror in the house of like, oh my God, she's awful without hormones. Like, what is she gonna be like now? And they, you know, utilize the older sister in that episode who has gone off to college, who sort of like brings it back to a more relatable situation of explaining what she's about to go through and, and sort of the changes that she's just going to have to get used to as opposed to it being this like awkward generational gap between her mother at that point and the young girl. So that's a great episode if you haven't seen it. Um, and I also think just to the last couple points, making it more normalized, you know, it's, it's absurd that when, first of all, people think that children are way too precious. And so they lie to them and they don't give them direct answers. And so when uh, the truth is children three, four, five, six are very open and able to comprehend the truth if you deliver it in a, a, a calm and rational manner. And, um, and so when little kids are like, mommy, daddy, where do babies come from? There is an area in there to explain, like not only when two people love each other, but also like, well, 
because mommy's body works like this and daddy's mm -hmm. body, you know, and just sort of like incorporating things because we over sexualize absolutely everything and girls can't even go to school today without like shorts under their skirts and mm -hmm. shoulder and all of this stuff. And it's just like, cut it out because if we didn't have periods and if we can't talk about them, then literally none of us are here. Like none of us are here without periods. Mm -hmm. And so those are just a couple of my things. But I loved what all of you were having to say as well about your various takes on the mm -hmm. subject. I'm excited to read the book. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for us? Thank you so much for coming here today. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, did you, for all of you, did any of you do any research on, like, PMS and the kind of, the stigma about, you know, oh, she's hormonal, oh, you know, that's why she's being bitchy, that's why she's being sad. Like, how, how that's portrayed in our culture and how that is, like, what's the science behind, if there is, behind PMS? Um, I didn't touch too much on the science behind PMS. Um, I did touch on very specifically, um, black girls in PMS um, because, well, okay, I'll rewind a little bit. Um, statistically, um, black people with vaginas get their periods at an earlier age um, than uh, white people, Asian people, Latina people, not that black, I mean, you can be black and Latina, but um, that in turn, when you combine that fact with the fact that um, black people generally are very stigmatized in school environments in the first place, mixed with PMS-related hormones, mood swings, things like that, that has led to such a blatant, stigma, like, aggressive stigmatization of black girls in schools, um, and people don't make that connection very often. Um, and uh, I think that well, that's a shame because people don't really, people generally don't take PMS very seriously in the first place. I think that even I didn't until mine got really bad <laughs> as I got older. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, without that, at least empathy there, uh, that's not gonna do any good for anyone, especially people who are already marginalized in certain spaces. So it really just made, when I found that out, it made a lot of sense and also made me incredibly angry about the fact that that's just another just like pile of garbage that a lot of like black girls in um, America's education system deal with. They can't even, you know, uh, they, there are plenty, I mean, yes, there are people who are just, who may just be, have emotional problems. There's also plenty of girls who might just be acting out because they're in a, because they're menstrual and they're going to receive way harsher punishment than a white girl who also maybe acted out. And that was my little bit on PMS. I don't really know a lot about the science behind it, but I'd like to know it too, because it's really bad now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of different studies with different conclusions. Uh, probably one of the more recent ones was that PMS hormones don't scramble your brain and there's no such thing as period lady brain, which makes us crazy and dumb. Um, <laughs> so for, I mean, for my chapter here, I really just focused on pop culture, but I'm a health journalist uh, by day. Um, and one of the things I write about frequently is what I call the period paradox, which is the fact that periods are simultaneously so detrimental and so terrible that they're uh, able to disqualify women from everything from uh, high paying or high positions in power and corporations. And you can't, you know, do this because you might have your period and go crazy. So it's, they're serious enough to disqualify us from things. But when you look at things like, funding of medical research into menstrual pain or anything period related uh, in the sciences, it's extremely underfunded and not taken seriously at all. Similarly, if you, you know, are having symptoms and aren't feeling well, you're usually told, oh, suck it up, it's just part of being a woman. Um, and so then that experience is devalued. So the period paradox is the fact that it's simultaneously able to take you down and disqualify you from things, but also is still not taken seriously. So which is it? Um, so that's kind of, that's, yeah, my take on that. And I've spoken to 
uh, a few researchers at uh, UC, one of the UCs, and uh, <laughs> there's so many of them, uh, that are, that's working in menstrual pain research. And she said, over the past few years, it's gotten a little bit easier to get funding from the NIH on menstrual pain research, but prior to that, it wasn't possible. And for her to get her first few proposals passed, she had to frame it in terms of men. So it was, men could benefit from this menstrual pain research because if we make gains on pain in general, that could benefit people with penises. So that was how it, <laughs> how it kind of first, how she managed to navigate the system. And it's definitely getting better, but we still have a long way to go because medical research is traditionally done on men and this is just a throwaway thing that happens to literally half of us. I would actually just jump in with one, one quick note sort of on, on the policy aspect of it too, and we had talked earlier this evening amongst ourselves about the idea of menstrual leave um, as, yeah. a, as a policy agenda. There, uh, it, it's been happening, uh, Japan's had it since yeah, 1947. In Asia, I think. Yeah, yeah and, and it was proposed in Italy this past year, and, and it creates that same paradoxical mm -hmm. question about how, how, how we view periods in pain and periods in pain and the ability to be, I'm gonna do a lot of alliteration here, you know, productive, powerful, all those things in our in our roles and how we how we manage those two. And is it admitting or 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 giving giving in to acknowledging weakness to say that these things need to be managed? Or or is it acknowledging reality and therefore empowering all of us? Yes. Um, I, I would add that my my we didn't really get into our answers backstage. My, my answer is that I think we have a lot of policy that we can use currently without having to step into this, this kind of trap of having it to be either or, and we can, we can explore whether things like uh, family uh, medical leave or mm -hmm. Americans with Disabilities Act could actually in embrace and include discussions about what painful or abnormal or, or challenging periods could entail. Um, but the paradox also exists in, in something we haven't talked about tonight, and there's loads we're not talking about tonight, which is the giant billion dollar industry involved in trying to make us feel bad about periods because they need to be concealed or because they smell or because they hurt or all these things you might not know, think about your own body and life already, but somebody who's trying to sell you crap is telling you. Um, so there's, there's just loads to unpacking that paradox from, from racial and disciplinary inequity to, to the ability to succeed in the workplace to the real physiology of our bodies. Mm -hmm. So it's a great question and I think that we would need like, yeah. like weeks more to unpack <laughs> it. And I say this as a non-doctor too. I don't really actually know anything about the science of it. So Well, I don't think that even a lot of doctors do because like Elizabeth said, I don't think there's a lot of funding like for people to go and do that research and actually find those answers. No, some of the more recent research is looking into brain function and they're doing brain scans of adolescent uh, people with vaginas to see uh, kind of what the brain looks like when they're experiencing menstrual pain. So they're kind of just, but yeah, this isn't something that's taught in medical school other than it happens. And maybe you could have a complication or endometriosis or PCOS or something like that, but no. And I'll actually do a shout out to uh, several new books that are out this spring, uh, including Abby Norman's Ask Me About My Uterus, um, which is that, this, that women's own stories of their pain are not acknowledged by the medical establishment and not, not even taught in, in medical training about how to do that. So the idea that it has to be viewed through the lens of how does it affect men or how does it affect the full population is, is about the only recourse we have as, as citizen patient you know, asking for our, our, our rights. Wow. One more question, if anybody wants to jump in. Okay, well, I can come up with one. Um, just kind of following up on that. Um, like, do you think that, that um, I, I think there's this struggle for many women, I know certainly for myself, that like when you are dealing with physical aspects of you know, menstruation and all kinds of things that happen in uteruses, um, to, uh, to, to not want to acknowledge that, to not want to look like you're a lady who's got a lady problem that is like, you know, uh, and I think maybe, but maybe that sets us back. Maybe, you know, we need to be more upfront about it and, and to destigmatize that and to have it be acknowledged. Um, you know, I think maybe, we're just perpetuating that by not wanting to look like, you know, lady flowers with like lady problems and, you know, be seen as weak in that way. I'm at a point now where I'm just like, I don't, 
personally, I just don't have the patience to couch it in anything but what it is. Like, for example, like, um, my boyfriend likes hiking. We, we decided a long time ago that we we're going to go to, like, a national park in July. It's coming up. Months ago, I'm just like, listen, <laughs> if I'm going to be in my period during this, it's going to be hell. And I just want to be, like, really upfront about that. Like, I'm not going to feel good. Even if I don't have really bad cramps, I'm just not going to feel comfortable. I'm going to be more tired. I'm just not going to be up for it. Luckily, you know, thanks to, like, cosmic whatever, it's not going to be during that week. But I'm at a, I think that the combination of just not really having the patience to kind of hide it. And also, but I also have to admit, I've been in workspaces in which most of my coworkers also menstruate which has been incredibly helpful in the fact that like, I mean, we have at work right now, like a thing called the trash cabinet, which has like a bunch of snacks, candy and tampons. <laughs> so it's just like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's not like a big deal to kind of be like someone getting a tampon from the trash cabinet. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the spaces that you're in really kind of yeah. can and either it can be generational too. I mean, I feel like yeah. people who are, you know, younger than I am are better at this, you know, kind of they've gotten to a different place. And even just small things like walking to the bathroom when you're at work um, and feeling the need to put your, you know, do the old tampon off the sleeve yeah. or tampon in the cleavage. Or if you have a pad, you know, can you make it like put it right there so it just looks like a little extra pad. Not that I, you know. <laughs> and so, yeah, if, if, if we're just, you know, it, it's just a simple act of taking a tampon yeah. out of your bag and walk into the bathroom in your office yeah. without acknowledging it. And you have to be like, I don't have my period or I do have my period. Yeah. Just kind of making it part of everyday life i think is yeah absolutely is a good step absolutely i was reading um recently a book by a female comedy writer who uh was like i think the only well i think there have been two women who worked for david letterman when he had a tv show um and this was one of them and what she said when she was hired she was the only woman there at the time uh was that she it, like dave letterman said to her at some point you know hey before this is over i'm going to see a tampon fall out of your bag like this was like you know like a bad thing that was obviously going to go down and um and then eventually that did in fact happen and you know like i think he th thought that that was a funny and gross horror um that it just it just really struck me as like you know this is like the fear you know and you, i mean i think probably we've all done it i've spilled them out all over the place on you know cvs counters and everything when i'm digging in my bag um and yeah i think like all of that stuff, like we should just be getting them out wherever. Like that's a small step that we can all take, I think, to make it normal. And I, I totally agree, but I also want to acknowledge that I say this as someone who like still kind of whenever, like I'm going to be real, like if I'm in the bathroom and I need to like open the tampon wrapper, I'm still like, I hope no one like heard me like, oh, like no. in the bathroom stall <laughs> next to me, which is so immature. And I like do it. I'm just like, everyone here like knows what the sound is. <laughs> it's not a big deal. So like, and like sometimes I do, I'm, I'm getting better about it, but you know, when like, when you're younger, especially, and you like are at like CVS or Walgreens or something, and you like have the back, the big box of tampons and you uh -huh. go up to like the guy at the register right. who's like kind of cute and you're like, yeah, here it is. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm getting better at it, but I mean, <laughs> it's, I think that it's a work in progress and it's like no shame if you're still like a little bit like uncomfortable with those things because we're socialized with being, it's uncomfortable. I mean, yeah. It, and like that's real too so just little baby steps if that's still an issue i'm just going to offer a little little like wisdom for people to have in their heads and this is less about me and my own period at work although i i seem to talk about it now everywhere and anywhere whether my colleagues like it or not um but people will often ask like if it's intimidating to go speak to legislators or testify in front of legislatures when it's mostly men and you know and what does that feel like and i always say it's actually the best because their discomfort is all my power uh -huh. and whatever few moments it takes for them to catch their stride I use their pause to completely own and frame exactly how we're going to talk about it exactly what kind of body language we're going to use exactly what, voca what vocabulary we're going to use um, and honestly they look like an idiot if like after five seconds they can't keep up like mm -hmm. you know they have to and and then by then 
the tone is already set. So I try to carry that into sort of my everyday. And I don't, I don't like relish in making people uncomfortable. That's not the goal. Um, sometimes it is, but <laughs> but mostly the goal is just to make them feel as comfortable as I do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And 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 to let them know that this is the, this is how we're gonna do this. Yeah. Um, and so I would urge everyone to get a little bit of that. And and if and if you're having trouble, like picture it being Paul Ryan or something, and enjoy the fact that you have the power and they don't. You know, for as long as that little moment in time lasts. Picture showing Paul Ryan your like bloody tampon yeah. or something. Okay. Yeah. I. I think this is an excellent note for us to end on, <laughs> harnessing the power. Um, thank you all so much. <laughs>